Hello, and thank you for joining us for delivering the perfect QBR. I'm Seth Wilson, Marketing Director here at Cloud Radio, and today we're going to let our CEO, Jeff Ferris, do all the talking. QBRs are very much his thing. After that, we may have some time for questions, so feel free to submit those. If we don't get to them, we may very well make them the subject of a future webinar. Uh, so, you know, we have another webinar coming up on the 11th, uh, covering our June product updates, and we'll have a Q&A at the end of that presentation. You can register for that at cloudradial.com slash events. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Jeff to show you how to deliver the perfect QBR. Hey, thanks Seth. So today's gonna to be a lot of fun. Um, I think we talk more about QBRs uh, in this industry than, than any other industry because it's one of the few industries that actually preaches a QBR gospel. Uh, today, um, if, you're, if you're worried about QBRs, if you feel like clients don't understand you, uh, if you're stressed or worried about them, if you're frustrated, then you're in the right place. We're going to cover, if you will, the generic QBR. We're not going to go so much maybe into the ones where you're doing uh, co-managed IT or real advanced uh, situations. Those tend to have a life of their own. We're going to focus on that bread and butter QBR that you're doing or should be doing or feel you should be doing with all of your clients. Before we get in there, I just uh, I want to make sure you understand who we are because I know there's a lot of people on this call today that have never uh, heard of Cloud Radio or maybe uh, got the, this link or this this webinar from a friend. So at at its core, Cloud Radio is a SaaS solution for MSPs. For you, it's a uh, an integrated account management platform. It's designed to reduce your cost, and improve sales, and in your client retention. For your clients, Cloud Radial is your branded portal. Uh, it is what you will use to make your business more transparent and digital to your clients. A little bit about me before we get started. Um, I've been a serial entrepreneur uh, for as long, again, forever, I guess. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's something that uh, I've worked on, again, for it seems like my entire life and focused on really kind of three things. The first company, um, was a company that was back in the Novell and Banyan days. And for anybody younger in the audience, you have to go way back to this industry uh, pre-MSP, back when uh, MSPs were called FARs or integrators. Uh, so this goes way back. That company did really well, was really successful. Next business wasn't so successful, uh, but really focused on, on the marketing aspects. And the last one was focused on local business. And what's interesting, about this bio, especially as it comes together today, is you're gonna find that we combine all three of these elements in Cloud Radio. And just as a quick caveat, uh, this, is a, this is free advice, uh, and free advice is worth uh, what you pay for it. And in this time, I think it's gonna be worth hundreds of, hundreds of times more. Uh, so one of the things that you're gonna see very quickly in this presentation is that we think differently about QBRs. And I think we think differently about QBRs than everyone else. As we've talked to hundreds of MSPs, uh, as, re as we've reviewed other uh, providers, uh, QBR products and services, uh, I think you're gonna find that Cloud Radial is a really different approach. So to understand why we're so different, I think it's important to think about how we got here uh, today. And so if you looked at where we were in 2018, when we launched Cloud Radial, we had a lot of core important features in the products. They've been the building blocks uh, that we've been building uh, on this product ever since. And then today though, the product is so different. Uh, we've added the VCIO planner, we've added dashboards, we've added the desktop app, we've added CSAT, we've added PDF reporting, we've integrated with Adigy, Ovid, Data, and so much more. And all of that is thanks to our partners. Because at the end of the day, everything that's in the product since the original has come at the suggestion, recommendation, and sometimes design uh, of our partners. So, so if you recently bought the product, chances are you bought because of one of those features that we just added. If you've heard about us, um, it's probably because of one of those features. And in fact, if you're here today, you're here because of those features, because those features have enabled us to grow rapidly. and allowed us to grow to the point where we can put on uh, these webinars. So how do we how did we get there? How did we get to the process of, of rolling out the product over time? 
it's all about listening. And we design listening at Cloud Radio into everything we do. Uh, we ensure that everyone in our company can do a demo on our product, that they can use it, you know, they can describe the product at parties to their friends, to their family, because we want them not to be able to explain it. We want to, we want them to be able to hear the reactions back to it. And so everything that we do is about listening and learning. Uh, if you call support, it's about, it, we're learning from that. It, we watch how you onboard. We watch where you struggle in the product. We watch where you go on the website. We watch everything that our clients do so we can get smarter and better uh, with our approach. And why is that important? Listening pays off and it has for us and it has for mostly any business that, that listens to their client. For us, it's been a steady, steady stream of record months, constantly improving product, a great backlog. We have so many great features on the roadmap going forward and it's all thanks to uh, partners uh, contributing and because we put in place the mechanisms to listen and more importantly it's starting to pay off in the, in the opportunity to find transformative opportunities in in my very first business the one that went public that was all that there was two critical customer interactions that launched the foundation that allowed us to basically double revenue in a year because of something a client said that we picked up on that was transformative. Listening is, is the key to any business success. So how does listening relate to QBRs? Well, you've heard time and time again that, that listening is one of the things that you need to do in the QBR, but I wanna take it a step further. You're, you're gonna use listening in the QBR to facilitate two primary goals. And the first one is actually the most important. And that is that the QBR should make you a smarter and better company. And that, and then secondarily, the QBR should actually make your client a smarter and better company. And I wanna come back to the first one just a second because at the end of the day, a lot of times you're there in the QBR to talk to the client and educate them about what you do. And so the perception is you're there to make that client smarter. And really that's not the goal at all. Your goal in that QBR is to listen on how you can become better. Because a, a successful, if you're doing QBRs to all of your clients and whether you've got 10 clients or 100 or 1,000, it doesn't matter. Each one is a golden opportunity to make your business better and stronger. So, and, and to segue that or to put that in perspective, if you're still selling the same thing you were selling five years ago, you know you're leaving opportunity on the table. I mean, the world has transformed tremendously since Windows Server 2008, 2012, even from Server 2016, those technology transitions and the way Microsoft is approaching that, that process is, is changed a lot. And that's giving you the opportunity to sell more things. So we know they're changing, not only the technology that's changing under, underneath that, but we've also seen with COVID that there's a tremendous change in the marketplace. Uh, almost overnight, people discovered mobility. In, in one country alone, Zoom downloaded 2 million downloads in a single day because technology didn't only transform business life, it transformed personal life. And those QBRs won't be the same after that either. Already we're seeing QBRs that were, uh, were previously done in person, now they're done via Teams. And, and that's changed the dynamic quite a bit. But more importantly, it's forcing a change in the topics in the QBRs. So rather than the QBRs focused on, uh, on labor, in other words, what you're doing in ticketing, what you're doing in service, uh, the topics are changing to the processes. Here's the processes that we have in place. Here's the processes this company needs in place. We're gonna be onboarding employees. We're gonna be bringing people to work from their home. We're gonna be people to bring them into um, hopefully a healthy workplace. So we're focused a lot on the, um, we focused previously on the labor, we're focusing on the processes. But processes are more important with intellectual property. And it's easy to think about intellectual property in terms of patents, uh, in terms of, of maybe core technology or inventions, but everything that you do when you implement a process is potentially a intellectual property opportunity. So if you, you, know, you bring on Office 365, if you bring on, uh, you set up that tenant, as you manage that tenant, as you work with those, those clients, each of those interactions becomes a chance to put your own brand or mark or best practices on that. And each one of those opportunities is basically an invention. And that invention is your intellectual property. And the more things that you have that are your intellectual property, the more competitive you'll be in the marketplace. 
The other thing is the bread and butter of QBRs from a few years ago are now, they're still important, but they're, they're, they're history, right? So if we look at ransomware, we've heard about ransomware. We know it's worse uh, this year than any year. We know that ransomware uh, is, is a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar business uh, that's designed to take money from, from your clients, from you, from us. And we're going to take, but at the same time too, ransomware is now baked into everybody's thought process. So it's almost like uh, the tax code. You know, when there's big tax changes coming, everybody thinks about how they're going to use that deduction, how they're going to change their business, how they're going to restructure. Uh, the recent changes we've had in the U.S. caused a frenzy of, of tax advice and tax webinars uh, and structural changes. But, but that was last year. And now we're not talking about that anymore because that's baked into everybody's assumption. And ransomware and the things that are related to that are now just baked in. And MSPs especially are just expected to prevent their clients from, from getting ransomware. So, so as you work with the clients and now you walk in there with a, with a really smart ransomware prevention scheme, that was a given. You were supposed to do that already. So the other thing that's changing too is that companies are changing um, dramatically internally. So that it's, it's almost like a shift from maintaining the status quo to maintaining survival or adapting to change. So it's not enough to make sure that the servers and the workstations were working exactly as they were a year ago, because now in today's post-COVID world, everything's been relocated. Uh, things have to go to the cloud. The businesses that you deal with are trying to figure out how to do exactly what we're talking about today. They're trying to figure out how to become more digital and more sustaining. So all of these changes for an MSP are your opportunities. Even though it's uncomfortable to get in there and talk about change or deal with that change, or it's a lot of overtime and labor, as you've, have, as you've all have seen uh, with the recent changes, the bottom line is change is your opportunity to grow and transform your business. So we're getting close to the meet, I promise, but I want to give you one or my take on QBRs. One is I hate QBRs. I think about a QBR and I think about the insurance agent coming to tell me how to adjust my life insurance for my advancing age or my uh, my lifestyle. I don't want to talk to my insurance agent when it's really just about a time to pick my pocket. And I also think about when it comes to QBRs, I think about the electric company. If an electric company came to me and said they wanted to talk to me about the transformers and the power lines and the substations that ensure that they provide 100% uptime for my electricity at my house, I don't care. I don't, I don't care about that. What I care about is if that electric company can come in here and tell me how I can save money, how I can make money, how I can reduce risk. I don't want to talk to somebody about their business. I want to talk to them about my business, right? We're all very selfish. We all very, very much like talking about ourselves and the problems that we have. And at the end of the day, your clients are exactly like that. And so when you go in there to talk about your business, it's not as exciting. I think of it, I think of QBRs again, as they are today, there's a lot of talk about the MSP's business and let's sometimes let's talk about the client's business. So, so the second thing that I think defines um, my take on this is I love talking to customers when they are excited about something I can help them with. There's nothing that I like better than talking to clients at Cloud Radio, our customers, when I understand that we're helping them solve a product and they're now they're energized. They're telling me how we can make our product better. We're telling them how to use the features they already have. We're, we're, we're now in a, in a, in a pure listening mode of each other because we're now listening and growing and adapting for that. And I love that process of working with clients. The next piece that you got to remember about me is I'm lazy and cheap, but I'll work really, really hard and I will invest a lot of money so I can indulge those two passions. If I want to spend all day uh, sitting in the backyard, you know, sipping a drink, I want the option to do that. Right. And, and I want to, but I also know that I have to earn that. So if I can work hard and invest and put things in place, uh, if it, like automation, if I can automate things, integrate things, that's gonna be, be even better. And then lastly, while I'm indulging in the backyard, I wanna know that everything's running exactly the way it's supposed to be while I'm doing that. I don't wanna have to worry that things are breaking, things are falling apart while I'm enjoying a, a, a fresh summer day. So in fact, I hate QBR so much for the rest of this presentation, we're not going to refer to them as QBRs. We're going to refer to them as MORs, M-O-R's, right? Which 
the way we describe that is a mutual opportunity review. And I think that will become more clear as we get into this, but we don't like QBRs. We're going to call them Moors. So just bear with us on that. So now let's set the stage because a Moor is not a QBR, right? And, and it's a little misleading. I mean, you can still think of them as QBRs and, and the title's not wrong. Um, we didn't we didn't suck you into the webinar with false pretense. The more is basically what the QBR should be morphing into, what they should be becoming. So, but a more is not a is is not a QBR in the traditional sense. And before you even get to that point, there's three things you need to focus on. The first is mindset, which is who am I? Who am I in relationship to that client? In you know five ten years ago, I I was the guy that managed the servers. I was the guy that managed the endpoints. I was the guy that made sure Office um, CD-ROM would install on that computer. So the mindset of who you are then and who you are now is going to have to change to adapt to this new world. The next thing is on uh, product. So basically, at this point in time, we want to focus on. Um, what we sell and you're going to see that that's one of the most important things we're going to cover today because and we'll go into that more detail but again the way you define your relationships with your clients is about the product and lastly it's about digitalization so how do you deliver what you deliver to your clients and it makes a big difference so let's start with mindset so in mindset the the best way to think about in mindset is the mismatch stacks of what you sell versus what your clients buy. So I wanna spend just a second here on the right-hand side because what we have is a is seven categories and the seven categories really go from bottom to top in importance to the client. At the lowest level, the clients wanna be efficient. If they, can, if they can get something done in four minutes instead of five, they're gonna to wanna to do that. And efficiency is important. And, and the more efficiency you can drive, the more dollars you can save. So it's an important piece of this tier. Next comes security, uh, which is what we typically know is just being able to work in an environment where we're not threatened by dangers, whether that's physical or, or online, we want security. You can almost think about this as like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. At the lower levels uh, are the base elements. At the top is, is the ultimate goals. And so as we move up this stack, what you're going to find at these top or at the top levels, ultimately, if a client can buy a tool that helps them, or solutions, better way to say it, if they can buy a solution that helps them make decisions better, that's the home run. That's the holy grail. If you can see insights into your into your business and become a better business for that, that's huge. Collaboration, productivity, those are all the holy grails for small business. Again, if they can if they can work better, more efficiently now, especially when they when they're forced to, uh, it becomes a huge differentiator for them. So this is what the clients are buying and everything that they buy typically falls into one of these categories. Now, what most MSPs sell are things that may facilitate that or may that match into that, but they don't necessarily fit with the client's description. So, and I'll have to say in doing multiple companies, I never went into a new business thinking that this is gonna be my opportunity to buy a firewall or to buy a Office 365 license. Every time I was focused on the small business, I was focused on the small business, on the clients, and maybe the, the growth of that business over time. The tools um, that, that the typical MSP sells today facilitate that, but that's not why I went into business, and that's why your clients didn't go into business either. So let's take a couple examples. The first is a 365, now it's business standard. Was business premium, now it's Microsoft 365 business standard. So, we know that retails in the US for $12.50 a seat. But clients, again, clients didn't go into business to buy an Office 365 license. What they're looking for is decision-making, collaboration, productivity, things that the 365 license can do or can certainly help them with, but that's not why they, they bought it. They bought it for the, for the three things on the right. But that value to them is immeasurable. I mean, I put a value of $200 on there, but you could charge, it could be worth a whole lot more. And if you look at what people are paying for Salesforce and for line of business applications and what they'll invest as a business so they can make better decisions, so they can collaborate and, and be productive, they spend huge amounts of money on that. Um, so the difference between $12.50 a month that the MSP sells $365 for and that value of $200 plus on the client side is the, is the value that the MSP typically leaves on the table. Let's take another example, still in the Microsoft suite. Uh, so, so 
Intune, now Enterprise Mobility and Security, it's 874 a month. I mean, it's, you know, but that's not why people buy it. They buy it for compliance, security, scalability, efficiency, and that values $200 more a month easily, right? Because again, if, if the things work, uh, again, think about this, this is the hierarchy things. These things are near the bottom of the hierarchy. If these aren't working, nothing above that hierarchy works either. So, so again, what that's worth to the client, again, it's hundreds of dollars a month. What the MSP sells it for at 874 uh, is, is the value. That difference between 874 and those multiple hundreds of dollars is, again, typically the, the value that the MSP leaves on the table. So, so what delivers that expectation? So what actually goes through and walks through all of the, uh, the things that are involved in that transformation? Again, your client's looking for, say, for example, uh, productivity and collaboration. It's not a license that facilitates that. That's just that's just like the entry fee, right? That's like the the the, the money you you spend to get into uh, uh, into an event. That's not really why you're there. That's just the entry point. At, after that, it's all the other things that go with that, right? It's working with the management of that company. It's working through them to understand their needs, their goals, what their expectations are. From that, it's it's putting together that implementation plan. Uh, it's it's bringing on a project team to manage that project, is doing the prerequisite setup if you've got to buy other infrastructure, if you've got to move stuff to Azure, if you've got to move people onto Teams, you've got to basically sometimes do more work in the setup than you actually do in the delivery. Uh, it's procurement, I mean, maybe there's other devices, maybe there's, if you're doing Teams, maybe you want conference rooms, uh, you've got cameras, big screen TVs, all that stuff to set up. You've got to coordinate that with all the users. The more people in the company, the more confusion, the more people don't understand what's going on, more provisioning, and then we're still getting warmed up, right? Because at the end of the day, it's still about training, rollout, monitoring, security, support, upgrades, reporting, tips, helping clients get the most from all of that. And once you put all of that together, now you can start delivering the value. So again, let's go back uh, to this other slide. The license at 1250, is only one piece of that puzzle. What clients wanted was decision-making and collaboration. To make all that happen was putting all of this stuff together in a package that makes that work for, uh, for your clients. Once all this is in place, now a client can see that collaboration and transformation. So next phase is just as important. So now we wanna talk about the products and this is gonna build on uh, what we just talked about is now that we take the mindset, as we go to construct the products, what we want to do with the products is talk about how they fit in the scheme of the client's perceived stack, right? We know what our stack is because it's a technology stack, it's an implementation stack. From a client side, though, remember, they're, they're looking at for decision making, collaboration, productivity, and four other things, right? So, what we want to do with the product is to help design products that address that. Now, Products should define your solution, right? Products are important because they define why a, cl a client wants it. They define the differentiation, right? They, they establish consistency and they give salespeople something to sell. A product is your, is your wrapper around what you do. And there's a, we're gonna, again, we're gonna spend a little bit more time on this, but it's important that your product mix reflect what the client wants to buy because again we're going to use products to align what you have and what you know with what the client wants and what they're willing to pay for and if we do it right we're going to align it so the clients will pay more for it uh, because they'll perceive it as more valuable because it fits their check mark in the stack so let's go through some examples of products so we know we all know what netflix is but Netflix doesn't mean anything. It's not a name, right? It's a made up name. And so, but now if we say Netflix, almost everybody we talk to about Netflix has an idea of what that is. Underneath Netflix is a category. It's video on demand and Hulu and now Disney, they all have video on demand services and they're all some technology behind that. But we don't necessarily think about Netflix as video on demand. We think about it as, as entertainment. We think about it as a product because we've come to understand it. Uh, same thing with Office 365. Uh, it's a product name and people have a perception of Office 365 as soon as you say Office 365. So when at least they do in, in the techno space, they may not in the client side, but, um, but they certainly do in the MSP side. 
but again, it has a category as well. Cloud radial, same way, it's a, it's a product name. It's a made up word. It doesn't mean anything, but it lets us define that product to our clients. Now, you may call it a client portal. Uh, your clients may call it a client portal, but in the sense of having cloud radial, we're able to go beyond uh, the thing. And I think this is what's important with the categories. When you talk about a client portal, typically people think right away, it's like, especially in this industry, they think about ticketing portal, right? And so, so for some reason, ticketing portal and client portal have become synonymous when they're not. Um, you know, if we think about client portal, this is the problem with using categories. If you think about client portal, the challenge is going to be, uh, again, if we think about this space alone, if we talk about a client portal, uh, we have a preconceived notion of it, right? And, and the problem with that is that if we think about the client portal, and it relates to other industries. If you think if you're a Verizon user or an AT&T user, uh, basically any other vendor, if you buy from Amazon, their client portal doesn't start with ticketing. None of those portals open up to a ticketing portal. All of those portals open up to a place where you can discover goods and services, you can uh, cross sell yourself, you can upsell yourself, uh, you can get data about your account, you can check your past orders, you can view your minutes. Uh, you can see how long before an upgrade's available. Basically, you've got all that available in a client portal and very deep in the client portal of those providers is a thing called ticketing or support. So at the end of the day, the client portal, as it relates to MSPs, even talking about the client portal with the consumer sometimes or your clients can be a very, very confusing experience. So when you think client portal, we're attuned to thinking about ticketing portals with your clients, or they see client portals as having more capabilities. And so if we were to describe Cloud Radial as just a client portal, we'd be doing ourselves a huge disservice uh, because we can do so much more and, and we don't wanna fall in that category. And it's the same thing with managed services. If I say managed services, that's a generic category. And so everybody understands kind of what managed services is. But after talking to hundreds of MSPs, I can tell you that, that managed services from one MSP to another aren't necessarily that consistent. Uh, what you put into it, how you structure that, the way you have contacts or clients contact you, the way you respond back, what your SLAs are, uh, the service you bundle into there, what's included, what's not included. Managed services runs the gamut. And so if you walk in there to sell managed services, you sometimes can do yourself a big disservice because now the client, if they have any perception of that, it may be totally wrong. More importantly, you haven't given the chance for the client to come to understand it better. So I'll give you a couple examples. At, at a previous company, we worked to define managed services, not as managed services, but as trust care or trust care essentials. Because at the end of the day, trust care, trust care essentials were a way to get above that category label. And I wanna, and again, just one more thing to harp on it, but think about Netflix. We don't call it video on demand. We call it Netflix and that has a name. So let's go into this a little more, a little more depth. If you're a little bit of a development junkie, then um, there's formulas that make this work, right? And so here's some formulas, we're gonna go into more in depth, but when you define your products, it's important to kind of come back to these formulas and we'll go in, in more depth here. So product equals solution. Your product should solve a problem that's recognized by your client. It shouldn't be, um, for example, if, if a product might be uh, may be termed today managed firewalls. Firewalls don't necessarily, managed firewalls don't necessarily solve a problem for a client. So what you wanna do is you have to translate that, that product into something the client actually wants like security, right? And so a product needs to equal something that's recognized by the client as a need. And those needs are typically gonna come out of those seven layers we talked about earlier. The other piece is we want to uh, address one of the core pain points, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, but basically we wanna help them make money, save money, or reduce risk. If you think about it, that's what every client, is the core of every transaction, is how are you gonna make a money, save a money, reduce risk? So uh, then we also need to be able to communicate in a scalable price. Uh, if you're gonna spend a lot of time talking about pricing and how you come up with it, and if you make it too hard for the client, they won't necessarily be able to assign a value in their head to that problem solved. So again, if it's solving one problem, they'll be able to come up with a price in themselves once they understand the value. And well-designed products 
every client should want it if it applies to them. And all of your clients, to make sure they're happy, should have all of your products. So if your products are well designed, all of your products should scale across all of your clients. The other piece is a product, is a brand, is a story. And if I talk about cheeseburgers, and just, I mean, if you just close your eyes and you think about cheeseburgers, which I occasionally do, um, if you think about cheeseburgers, you're going to see, a, a, you're going to visualize a particular type of, of structure. If you talk a McDonald's cheeseburger, it changes the perception altogether. Uh, the perception of a cheeseburger and a McDonald's cheeseburger, those are two different things. And, and I think it's important to realize how transformative one single word is, like McDonald's, is to this structure. Products have a picture. They have something tangible that you can look at, or if you close your eyes, you can visualize it. So if you think, again, let's go back to McDonald's cheeseburger, it's a yellow wrapper. If I have a yellow wrapper, it's a McDonald's cheeseburger. If it's a white wrapper, it's just a hamburger. If it's a yellow wrapper, it's a cheeseburger. So I can identify, if I can close my eyes, not only can I see the McDonald's cheeseburger, I can see kind of what it's wrapped in as well. The other thing is they have a personality. We call them features and benefits. Benefits are the changes that the product is gonna bring to that client. So a benefit is I'm gonna work less. I'm gonna, I'm going to, to make more money. You know, I'm gonna become uh, smarter. Uh, and they have features, right? They're, they're, you know, this is how we're going to get it done. So we, uh, if you think about it from a person standpoint, you know, the features are uh, that they are, uh, you know, nice or kind or smart. Those are, those are uh, features. The benefit is that they're really nice to be around, right? So there's a benefit and there's a feature and that works for people and it works for products. The other thing, if, if any of you were Avengers fans, like, like me and my son were, then you'll understand that that all the good characters, all the good, all the good um, people have backstories. So again, if you if you go back into that movie when Iron Man saves the day by snapping his fingers, uh, spoiler alert, sorry. Uh, then you'll also understand that for him to do that, if you just saw that moment by itself, it wouldn't matter. You wouldn't understand how much went into that. But understanding, you know, that story over time, uh, knowing how Tony Stark evolved as a person and ended up at that moment where he saved the world, that was huge. And it made that movie work. So, and that's a backstory. And your product should have backstories as well. So, you know, we saw clients frustrated by this problem. So we created, you know, our XYZ managed services platform to address that. And so then conversely, they have success stories because again, the first time you sell it, it didn't, you know, you don't know, but the, if you sold it second, third or fourth time, you should be able to show clients who've had successes with it. So basically, you know, uh, she was, uh, it's like your resume, right? So if you look at your resume, it's all the places you have and on LinkedIn, it's the people that your testimonials, right? So uh, Steve's a great guy, loved work with him. That's the success story. That's Steve's success story. And your product has a success story as well. So again, XYZ was struggling until they bought our service and now they're happy. All right, so now we're gonna segue just a minute into Cisco. And I don't know if you've ever seen this truck. It's, it, it's very common inside of North America, uh, but Cisco is one of the largest food distributors um, in North America and maybe outside the country as well, but they supply restaurants. But I can't think of a single restaurant that I've ever walked into that says they sell Cisco food, not a single one. It's called Norma's, it's called Bubba's, it's called uh, Applebee's, it's called a lot of different things, but no restaurant says, hey, we feature Cisco food on our menu. They don't. But, you know, restaurants change suppliers, they change ingredients, they change recipes, they change processes, they sometimes change cooks. Uh, sometimes they even change locales, but at the end of the day, they use menus that isolate you from all of that. Those, those restaurant menus are their product list. And when you buy a hamburger, it may not be the same hamburger they delivered yesterday, may have different types of meat, different type of bun, may, may have got their vegetables from a different place. You don't care. It was a hamburger and you went there because you liked the hamburgers from, from, from that restaurant. And so what goes in behind all of that doesn't matter to you at the restaurant. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter to your clients either. Again, they're not buying Sophos firewalls. They're not buying uh, even Office 365. They're focused on, on the goals that they have for their business. So the other piece is products should always be greater than one. 
And your tiers, you know, your bronze, silver, gold should always be at least one, but preferably more. So clients should know the benefits of your products, but if there's too many benefits, you should split them out. So if you've ever um, sold something to a client and then later on they go, well, I didn't know that was included. I didn't know that was a part of our package. That means you left opportunity on the table because at the end of the day, the, the power of the sale should be, uh, should stand on its own. And so if there's more stuff bundled in with that, that's potentially opportunity lost. And that's an opportunity to break that service out as something else. So if you have managed services, a lot of people bundle security in that. You could also create a managed security offering underneath that as well. Because again, if, if managed services is about labor efficiency, the managed security is about security. You could have managed continuity. You can do different things to break that out rather than bundle it all into one. And the interesting part is as you do that, you get to create the backstory, the personality, the pictures, the logos that go with each one of those. And potentially you capture more budget because again, if you have a, a, a product to address each one of those tiers, now there's potentially seven line items you can sell a client rather than one. And then you use tiers to right size the product into the client. So let's take managed security. For a small client, managed security may be AV on the workstation, maybe a, a better Office 365 license and that it. For the advanced clients, it may involve everything from really advanced threat detection software to SIM tools and everything else. It doesn't mean though that you have to call those things different. It could be security essentials, security, uh, you know, silver and security super, right? It doesn't matter what you call them. And the products that make that up could be very, very different among themselves as well. So what you bundle in the first tier doesn't have to be the technologies is bundled in the next tier. What's important is that you use those tiers to right size the solution for the client. So again, you can sell at top level. If you're worried about security, you need our security product. And it, depending on your size, here's three different tiers, here's three different budgets, and you choose the tier that's right for you. So again, products and tiers help you structure all this complex, top, all this complex technology deliver uh, in an easy way. And last and maybe the most important, especially in, in a, in a post-COVID world where we're trying to adapt to change, is the formula testing equal true. So you're always looking for opportunities to create new products with clients. If, you're, if you've got an, a, a large product catalog today, that's great. But if you've got just one or two, like you're just in managed services, then you wanna think about how to productize it so that you can uh, brochure it. And you don't have to build it. You don't have to become an expert in uh, voice over IP, telephony, Microsoft's cloud PBX solution before you find out if clients would buy a cloud PBX solution from you. So if you can basically brochure it, you know, think a pitch deck, or even sometimes it's just a conversation. If you can then sell it, say, you know, Mr. Client, uh, uh, we see that you are using a phone system that's not giving you the mobility and flexibility you need. Would you be interested in having a solution that gave you that, that productivity that lets you dial from anywhere, that lets you take your phone with you wherever you went? If they say yes to that, now you can go build it. You don't have to put all your money up front to go build the solution. You can brochure it, you can sell it, and then you can build it. And so basically that testing process helps you refine your, your pitch, helps you refine your sales process, even before you spent the first dollar to go uh, research 27 different voice over IP providers that are out there. So one last thing in preparation that gets into digitization, right? So we're all familiar with how people digitize it to us, right? I mean, if you bought Cloud Radio, you know that you get invoiced online. You know that you didn't get a paper copy of the bill. You know that you can interact with us online. Uh, and you see the benefits with your own PSA, with the other tools you use, with your vendor portals, because they've all digitized those experiences with you. So, so what you need to think is how you digitize that relationship with your clients and what those benefits are gonna be and what you can achieve through that digitization. So it's not just about, um, being digital, it's about the efficiency and, and, and it's really about scalability. At the end of the day, we know it's we know a digital experience is 24-7. We know it can be more collaborative. We know it can be self-service, but it also brings about scalability. Anything that can be digitized can be scaled. And if you can't digitize it, that means you're always going to be stuck at labor. So as your business grows, you're going to be hiring more techs. Or you're going to be hiring more account managers. And so if you can digitize you don't have to grow as fast. I mean, again, that's the, the pitch of every PSA out there. So you, you do this digital experience, people work more efficiently, and so you don't have to hire as more to support people. 
it's, it's our pitch in cloud rail. If you buy cloud rail, you don't have to hire as many account managers, right? Or as you, and you can grow your business with the same tools. You know, we hear a lot of times about stack cost and, and, you know, my, Hey, my stack cost is getting very expensive. If you're putting money in your stack and you're not driving the efficiency and growth from, from client growth or, or more sales, then making yourself more efficient doesn't really help. It just makes you, it just costs you money. So what you want to do is when you digitize, you want to use that digitization and then you want to grow on top of that because now that's going to soak up that extra capacity. So now let's get to the more part. We're getting to the good stuff, I promise. So now we talk to more. So, and we, we touched on this briefly, but I want to go in a little more depth here, which is I think there's only three things that uh, clients want from, from any of their vendors. And it, it's, not, it's not unique to MSPs. It's the same thing basically I want from, uh, from anybody, anything I buy or any, any vendor that provides me regular monthly services. I want to know how you're going to help me save money, make money, or reduce risk. Right. Even Netflix. I mean, I get Netflix so I don't have to go to movie theaters. It saves me, you know, every trip to the movie theater can be a hundred dollars. Netflix is 12. So, you know, it's saving me $88 a month by not having to go to a movie theater. That's the cost savings value. I mean, again, all of this translates into saving money, making money or reducing risk. Right. So let's just give you an example because we get this all the time with uh, cloud radio and and I know this is works because these are the same questions that we've answered hundreds of times for our clients uh, as we try to describe our product value uh, to MSPs, which is how are you going to help us save money? How are you going to make us money? How are you going to reduce our risk? Well, we're going to we're going to replace the need for other tools. We're going to let you get more done faster. We're going to let you get more done with less account managers. You know, we're going to give you that services catalog so your clients can self service. We can. Uh, we can improve your outcomes. We can improve your pre-sales. We can reduce your client turnover. If we can answer these for cloud radial, then you can answer this about your products for your clients, because this is what they're at. Fundamentally, this is what they're going to be asking. So getting to the more part. So what, what do you take going into that presentation? Well, first, you're going to start with the right preparation, right? You're going to make sure that the information is already digitized and delivered. Right. No more printing stuff out to take to the clients unless unless you have to. Right. Um, basically, you want to be able to digitize all of that and provide it to the clients well in advance. We want to focus on mindset. We want to make sure that you have a client focus going in there, that you can understand what it takes for them to make the decisions. Right. You understand technology. You understand that, you know, you're super smart on all of the features that make up that that package and those offerings. And you know why you chose this antivirus over that antivirus and what your solution stack is and why it's there. Right. What's important, though, is the client thinking is to understand why they would choose the product overall, because they don't know the products and they don't want to know the products. They don't want to know the value of a, of a cloud based antivirus solution versus a a static signature based solution who cares right your clients don't you care but your clients don't they're just buying security so you need to go in there with the right mindset to think of what the client is wanting to buy then you also need to make sure that you've already pre-designed your products so that they're aligned with those with that product thinking right if you don't get the mindset right the products are impossible but with the right mindset then the products and with and especially when they're filled out with their backstories and success stories then it's great. So now all you've really got to do going in there is going in with a vision and a plan, right? So that's the most, you know, probably the most important part of this whole process is you need to know where you're taking them. I like to say, it's like, you should always have a plan for, for your client's life, right? There is no such thing as just getting by with your clients. You really should have a plan for them and where you're going to take them this year, next year, and the year after that. And sometimes the things are changing. So you might have a plan for them one month and then new technologies roll out, new opportunities roll out, and you're going to change that. That's okay. It's important though that you have a plan and the client already sees, always sees where you're gonna take them next. If you think about its relation, you know, how many times you've heard uh, in different movies, well, this relationship doesn't have a future. It doesn't have a future because there's no plan. What's the plan for the relationship? And lastly, you have to have excitement. You know, if you're not excited about going to talk to the client, don't go see them, right? Don't, don't see a client that you're not excited about talking to. Uh, you know, I mean, if it's, if, I mean, if it's contracted, yeah, maybe you've got to do that. And there's things that you have to review, but basically what you want to do is you want to be excited about the chance to get that client in a better position because you know exactly from your products, how you're going to make them money, how you're going to save them money, how you're going to reduce those risks. 
And, and being, being helpful to clients is typically why you got in the MSP space to begin with. So if you can go in there with excitement and show them the value of what you're gonna do, it's gonna be huge and they're gonna see that excitement. Now, now we're ready for, uh, uh, so now we're ready for uh, delivering the perfect more, right? I'm not gonna say the Q word, right? We're gonna call it more. So now we're in there. First thing we're gonna do, even before we get there, is we're gonna inform them in advance. And this is where a lot of the stuff we're gonna talk about now is really kind of pulling together all of the cloud radio attributes because it's it's harder to do this uh, without cloud radio. I mean, you can send them a bunch of email in advance, you can send them a bunch of PDFs in advance, but basically you wanna inform them in advance of all the basic status information. You don't wanna spend half your QBR, or sorry, more, you don't spend half your more in there talking about what you did for them over the last three months, right? We're not looking backwards unless, unless we need to address something, we're looking forwards. So we wanna make sure that all the information they have is available to them uh, before you even get in that meeting, right? So again, they can come prepared with their questions. If you walk in there and, they, and the client says, I don't know, I don't have any questions, that's because you didn't forearm them with other things that they needed to look at, right? So if your client's not, armed to ask you about other things that you can do, you didn't prepare them, right? And so they're having to play catch up. Again, they haven't, maybe they haven't seen you in three months, maybe they haven't seen you in a year. You've been thinking about them maybe every day, every week, as you've seen the reports, as you've seen the reports on names. If you're not, if you haven't seen your client in a few months, I can guarantee your client's not sitting there worried about how you're doing. They're worried about how they're doing. And they may or may not see you. So when you get a time on their calendar, it's almost like popping a clutch on a car. They're not, they're not necessarily ready for that conversation. And you're gonna to have to give them time to come up to speed so they can even get their head around why IT or why what you do for them is important. So if you inform them in advance or better yet, keep them informed every day, uh, which is the, the, the power of a, of, a, of, a, of a real client portal, then uh, basically they're ready to uh, talk to you about the issues they found and they've discovered. The other piece you're gonna do uh, potentially is if you can, show them your own services catalog well in advance of that meeting, basically they've had a chance to shop in advance. I mean, how many times have you walked into a Best Buy and somebody comes up to you and goes like, hey, can I help you? I know they're trained to do that, but I don't like that. I like, you know, I like to shop. I mean, I like to shop. I don't like people to sell to me. I like buying. I don't like being sold to. So when, as soon as that person comes up to me in Best Buy and says, hey, how can I help you? I tense up. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't know what I want to buy. I'm just looking. And so what we want to do is with the services catalog, we want to let the browser or let your clients browse before you even get there. We don't want them to have to figure out, we don't want, they don't want to hear it. And you really don't want to say it about the 20 things that you can do for them. They just rather discover that for themselves. And so we're going to give them the service catalog to go do that. So again, they're armed in advance with not only the information they have about the business, but they also are armed in advance with uh, the information about what you can do and whether it applies to them. The next piece is you're gonna come prepared. And so typically that's putting things together, but with most of the other tools on the market, it's very labor intensive. And so what we wanna do is automate as much of this as possible, pull all of it together in one portal. So again, not only is it beneficial to the client to have all this information in one spot, it's super beneficial for the account manager to have this in one spot, because at that point in time, they can see they don't have to log into different portals either. They can see it all in one place. So then they can just look for exceptions. So if I've got automatic data collection, I can spot exceptions easily. I already have a pre-built product catalog and I've rounded up my best suggestions from staff. I put that all into an account planner and the account planner is the way to prioritize and organize things for the client. But now more importantly, once I'm in that meeting with them, I wanna be able to adjust the plan and budget in real time because I don't wanna find a situation where I'm sitting there with the client and having to draw things on paper that I need to take back to the office. What I want is a plan that we both agree on. If you think about this, this is the, the, the yes board, right? This is the chance to get the yes from the client. Do you wanna do this? I really think you should do this in Q3. If you can't do it in Q3, we're gonna leave it and recommend it, right? But basically we're gonna monitor our progress. And more importantly, we're gonna be able to see exactly how we're doing as far as completing the plan that we have for them. Because again, we see a column on the left called recommended. We've got a column on the right called installed. And our goal really as in, in that QBR or sorry, more, is we wanna basically move the stuff from recommended to installed because we know 
based on the way we've designed the products and the way we, we know that we're solving their core problems, if we move everything from recommended to installed, they're gonna be happy. The other piece is the questions are gonna come up. Why do we need to look at upgrading our, our, our servers? Why do we need to upgrade our, our systems? Why do we need, you know, how do you know we're not using Teams effectively? How do you know that we're, um, uh, we're not, our email's not protected? We need to address all those things with evidence. We don't need to go in there and say, well, I'll get back to you in three months, or I'll get back to you at the next QBR. I'll get that information put together for you. We'd love at the time, just be able to address it right then. You've got FaceTime with the client. It's super valuable. You need to address all their questions while you're there in front of them. When you leave that office, your chance for them to remember and be excited about that opportunity again may diminish. So if you can address all of it in the meeting with the evidence that it's gonna to take to help that client get up to speed, all the better. And if the data is visual or, or accessible, um, that's all the better. So if you need to understand why machines are slow, out of date, why stuff's out of warranty, how that's gonna help them with productivity, you need to be able to address all of that again in the meeting with the right evidence. And then lastly, uh, we wanna look at for the what ifs. Again, it goes back to that, that testing equal true formula. So anytime we find a what if, like if we could design, if we if you had a voice over IP system, would you, would you implement that? Would you want that in Q3? Get that on the board, identify those, those what ifs, add those one offs to that client, and then work yourself backwards to develop that plan. So again, as you find the one ifs, capture it, get it on the roadmap and get the yes, and then go back and fulfill it. Or if it's uh, uh, simple an extension to an existing project, get that captured, get that on the board. So, so lastly, once you do it across all of your uh, clients, we wanna make sure that your more process is consistent across all of your clients. And so what you want is what we call the sales matrix. It's a report that's out, that comes out of Cloud Radio, but basically it maps all of your core products across all of your clients so you can see at a glance. Because part of the problems with Moore's is that you go in there and you're trying to sell, the way I see it here is you're trying to sell across the row. So you're trying to make sure a client has all the products that they need to have on that list when really that's not the best way to sell. Nobody sells to you like that. What they all do is they market specific services to you because you have a need. So if I can look down a column and see who doesn't have our managed security offering, for example, now I can just target those clients about managed security. Now I can approach the process from a product perspective, from product marketing perspective, because now I'm in there, I can build all the literature and the, the email campaigns and maybe um, some, some brochures around why this managed security is really gonna help them, why it's gonna help them with their business. Again, make money, save money, reduce risk. So the way we think about it is, is think about the more as MSP 2.0. At the end of the day, what you wanna do is use more in your more process and, and hopefully you revise your updated client portal to reintroduce yourself to clients. If they've known you primarily as a a, a company that prints information off as, as somebody that emails information to them uh, or a company that's not very transparent, this is your chance with implementing the more process to reintroduce yourself to clients and, and basically restart that relationship with your clients. So at, if you do that right, this more process is your MSP 2.0. And if you, it gives you the chance to do less, less you selling and more client buying, right? Because nobody, even salespeople sometimes don't even like selling, right? They like when, when people are buying from them, but they don't really like pitching. That no, Nobody likes cold calls. Nobody likes doing that. So from a client perspective, we're just telling you to stop selling. Just work a plan, just work your, your portal, work your service catalog, and don't try to become the master salesperson or necessarily the master marketer to your install base. Just let your plan and your processes do the work for you. So again, don't become salesperson. If you're, if you're excellent at computers, you don't need to be excellent at selling. You just need to be excellent at working this more process. Uh, the other piece is when you walk in there with this MSP 2.0 strategy, your stuff is now transparent, right? You're, you're now providing clients information anytime they want, whenever they want. So if you think about most SaaS products, for example, and when you go to, let's say Trello or Rike or any other tool that's out there for the most part, if you go to the website, it's always for people that don't, that aren't in the know, but there's always a login button in the top right that gives clients something special and it gives them access to the client portal or to the application. So the client portal is for clients and it's the most important way you're going to communicate with your clients. 
So the, the website is for your prospects, the client portal is for your clients. And basically when you do all of this, you're gonna shift from a reactive account management mode, which is, oh, QBR time, I gotta, I gotta busy, get busy and do this, to a proactive account mode, we're basically gonna be in there 24 seven. Lastly, just a shameless plug, product plug for Cloud Radial, is the product's designed to deliver the perfect more. It's a platform for mindset, product, and digitization. You know, again, it's a product that's gonna help you drive your efficiencies up, your costs down by delivering that 24 seven experience. And it's designed to make more super easy to prepare and super easy to present. And again, the goal is that the portal is the leave behind. You don't need to print uh, uh, a stack of paper to go in there and convince clients you know what you're doing. You can now use the portal and they're gonna see exactly every day that you've got them organized, prepared, that you're backing up their data, uh, that you're monitoring their endpoints, that you're ensuring their workstations are upgraded and patched. You're gonna, they're gonna see all of that. And the best thing about our process and this more process and Cloud Radial especially, is it scalable to any size business. We've got clients in the top 25 MSP 501. We've got one man shops and the product works great across all of those. So there's never, you're never typically too small to have Cloud Radial and you're certainly never too large. And it's, it's the power of the more process that makes, makes that work. So I wanna, uh, again, if you're interested in Cloud Radial, uh, you can sign up for a trial at cloudradial.com slash trial. If we've covered uh, issues in this presentation that your existing client and you go, oh my goodness, uh, I missed that feature update, then contact us at support uh, and we'll be glad to get you on track and updated with all the features. Now, I think we've got three minutes left for questions. Um, and Seth, is there is there one that um, we'd like to cover? Uh, let's see here. Um... Well, yeah, Dan, uh, Dan B. asks about uh, the, the MOR labeling, and is it important to, to, to call it out to your customer? He assumes that, that we wouldn't, wouldn't be using that as a client-facing term. You can use it either way. I mean, I think the, the more term is interesting because it's, it's a way to redefine that relationship. If your client's used to QBR, uh, what we found with the Q was the Q was, seemed optional. So the, the, sometimes it wasn't quarterly, it was annual. We've heard, we've heard of annual you know, ABRs, we've heard of OBRs, which occasional business reviews. Uh, we've heard NBR, which is never business reviews. Uh, and so if, if QBR has a great connotation to your client, keep it. If it doesn't have a good client connotation, do something else. Cool. All right. Well, we got a couple more questions. We're, we're going to uh, reach out to the uh, people offline uh, that we were able to, to get to. But uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, we're going to upload this video if you want to uh, uh, share it or review it later uh, to our YouTube channel. That's at youtube.com slash cloud radial. Uh, you can check that out there. Uh, and don't forget to subscribe. Um, and uh, and we have another one of these coming up uh, June 11th uh, on our product update. And we'll be doing a, a, a an actual Q&A session uh, for that one. So again, uh, thanks for joining us and you guys have a great week. Thanks everyone. Stay safe.